Hey guys, Chris Olka here with another T&E video. This is T&E number five, featuring the Wessex Wyvern model TC590. It's a five quarter piston valve double C. Uh, and as of June 6th, listed on the Wessex tuba website, it's sold out. So it's clearly a popular tuba. And I'm gonna talk about why I think that is. But before I get to talking about the tuba, I want to talk about Wessex Tuba founder, Jonathan Hodges. So I, up until, I think it was late January or early February, just after the Army Band Tuba Conference this year, I didn't know nor particularly care who Jonathan Hodges was. I didn't know the name. I didn't really know much about Wessex Tubas other than they were importing uh, tubas from China and had been working with the Jin Bao factory to improve and expand the product line. But I didn't really know anything about him. Well, I got to meet Jonathan when he dropped off a truckload. He brought his tuba van and he dropped off a number of tubas for me to test and uh, review earlier on this year. And I really enjoyed the visit and the time with Jonathan that I got to spend. Uh, fast forward a couple of months later when he comes back by with the tuba van to pick up those tubas that he dropped off and leave the wyvern for me to, to test out. And I got to spend uh, another couple of hours with him and had dinner with him and my wife. And I have to say, I've really, I've come to really like Jonathan quite a bit. I think he's, first of all, he's a really, he's a classy guy. He's a class act. He's, he's a soft-spoken gentleman. But the thing that endears him to me is his clear enthusiasm for what he does, um, for the mission that he's kind of tasked Wessex Tubas with, which is, improving and expanding a line of tubas that anyone can afford uh, and, and, and raising the quality level uh, to what we all have come to expect for our hard-earned tuba playing and tuba buying dollars, so to speak. So uh, I just got to give a shout, shout out to uh, Jonathan. I really like the guy a lot and I wish, wish him and his company continued success. So enough on that, let's talk about the tuba. Uh, up front, I'm gonna talk about the things that I really like. Uh, I think this is a great tuba. It's a, it's a very versatile all around tuba and represents, I think, a kind of a almost class leading value for your dollar. Uh, right now, listed on the website, the lacquer version of these are being offered for 5,500 US dollars and a silver plated version is being offered for $5,950. That's a hard price to beat, and it's not, it's not a great price for a bargain tuba. It's a fantastic price for a great tuba, which is what I think this tuba is. Um, when I was trying to think of a, a catchy uh, title for the video, the first thing that came to mind was Jack of All Trades. Now, usually people follow that saying up with Jack of All Trades, Master of None. But that doesn't describe this tuba. This thing does a lot of things really, really well. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, first thing, it's well constructed. You know, uh, years past, we came to just take for granted that we we're gonna have weird out of aligned uh, slides and kind of janky valves that didn't feel good. Not the case with this tuba. All the valve slides, easily accessible, ergonomic, you know, easily manipulated. You've got this, this cool trick little uh, second, uh, second valve pull rod, which I like. All the, all the valves move well. <clears throat> they're tight and air, they're, I say, they're airtight. They're not tight. Uh, if, depending on the type of grease you put on them, they can be faster or slower. And if you want like a, I prefer my first valve slide, I like it to move like glass, like a trombone slide. This, the alignment on this is spot on, so you won't have any problem if you want to have a tech do a light lap on that. You'll get that, that trombone-like action on any of these slides if you want to. But if you don't want to worry about them falling out when you put the tuba on its belt, leave them like they are. They work fine as they are. Uh, piston valves, the action, again, quite good. They've got those signature wyvern uh, uh, valve buttons that are really cool. The engraving is actually functional as well as looking cool. It actually gives you a no-slip kind of grip on the valves, which I've, I've come to like. I didn't think I'd like it, but I do like it. It's growing on me. Uh, thick valve stems, 
I realize video doesn't really show it or do it justice, but the thickness of the valve stems make them quite robust, meaning that they're not fragile. Um, it, you know, it, it's not as if in the gig bag they're going to uh, get pushed over or if you, you, you knock into them a little bit with a music stand, you're not going to have to worry about damaging the tuba. Uh, the construction is quite robust, which is, you know, it's a good thing. They're, it's not, it's not penalty-free. The bracing on this is quite uh, solid, but it does make the tuba a bit heavy. We'll get into that at the end of the video. Uh, what else? Let's see here. Uh, some nice little custom touches that I like. The people, they used to do it on tubas in the United States in the 1900s, but it's kind of fallen out of favor, and I, I never understood why. I understand probably from a manufacturing perspective, it's an extra step and maybe not necessary, but these grease cups, these grease cups on all the slides, they actually do have a function, which is if you've got it lubed up and you're moving it in and out, you don't have to worry about the lubrication or the oil or the, the grease running down the slides, the outside of the outer slides, and, and mucking up your gig bag or getting all of your clothes. I like that. I mean, it doesn't really, it doesn't really bring any extra playing potential, but it's, it's a nice touch and I like it. Uh, as someone who is used to front action top pull slide tubas and has just gotten used to always doing this onerous task of dumping spit this way, you don't have to do that on this tuba because they've included spit keys in the crooks here. Like you can see on the, on the, the lower crook of the third valve slide and the lower crook of the fourth valve slide, these two uh, spit keys, you can see them here. All you have to do when you want to dump spit, bam. Don't try it on the floor or your shoe if you're not looking where you're doing it. I've done that. But that's kind of a nice touch. I like that. Um, what else? Let's see here. Great low register. I put that in all capitals. And this tube has a fantastic low register. Um, there are a lot of other tubas out there that have a good low register. This one has as good, if not better, low register than any tube I've ever played. So take that for what it's worth. But, you know, there's, as you guys, anyone that's watched my videos knows, I take great pleasure in, like, driving spikes and drilling holes in my roof of my basement by whacking on low notes. And this, this tuba is like a gateway drug for that. Uh, so fantastic low range. Versatile, even sound, I put. Uh, it's, it's a hybrid. If you can imagine... Uh, the core and density of like a Minel Weston 2155 or Minel Weston 2000, but with kind of the breadth and warmth of a Mirafone 1291 2 or 3 model, something like that, where the, it's kind of a little bit more billow in the sound, but really projected and very clear. If those two tubas had a, had a, had a love child, it would be this wyvern. It, that, I, that's a, about the best way I can describe it. Um, it's not a York, a classic York tuba sound. Uh, it's, it's definitely a bit more lit up and a little more aggressive, but it really retains some really lovely round characters in, in the sound that I like. Very functional tuba sound, we'll put it that way. Um, projecting, like I said, it, it projects like gangbusters. Um, it's an even sound from top to bottom. It, when you're playing soft, mid dynamic, and loud dynamic, the sound really has a great balance of low, middle, and high frequencies uh, and overtones in the sound. So it's just it's a complete sound all the time. I don't really find it lacking anything uh, in the lows, mids, or highs. It's just a, a balanced, even sound, top to bottom. Um, price wise. You know, I think we already touched on, on, on the prices for what it is. I think it's a, a, great, uh, a great value. If someone wanted to buy one tuba, if they just wanted to have a contrabass tuba to kind of do everything on, this would, would be right there in the, in the winner's circle. There's, you know, there's a couple of other models that I would look at as well uh, from other manufacturers, but this is definitely at the top tier of those, uh, those options. What would I use this tuba? If, if I were going to use this tuba, uh, I would use it in quintet uh, for most of the repertoire for quintet. I think it would do, it would really shine for quintet playing. Pit orchestra, where you need something that's going to support the orchestra, but not dominate the airspace sonically as far as like just 
be like a, a leg blanket on top of the orchestra. This would be a great, a great tuba for that application. Recording, recording soundtracks or in a recording studio, the character of this sound is going to saturate mics in a good way. Like you're not going to have to work to get on tape. Uh, solo playing, you guys know I'm a big proponent of doing solo repertoire on the contrabass tuba. And with as playable as this tuba is, you're not going to have any problems knocking out uh, solo repertoire that is, is well suited for the contrabass tuba. This is going to do it well. Uh, and then just basically any type of chamber music. If you're not a person that can afford ten or fifteen or thirty thousand dollar tuba, you're not really having to compromise much, if at all, by spending just shy of six thousand dollars for a silver plate in one of these. Uh, it's not like you're buying a bargain basement tuba. You're getting a really good tuba to do basically anything you need to do. So yeah, this is a one tuba, a one size fits all tuba for people that don't need to specialize, like orchestral musicians or you know, whatever else. It's a great freelance instrument. Uh, Jonathan, when, when he described this tuba, if I'm, if I'm getting my facts straight, this was, he's, he described this as like his kind of first proprietary design and was intended to be the early flagship of the uh, uh, C tuba uh, Wessex line. And, uh, you know, he's really, he's obviously proud of the tuba and rightfully so because it's, it's a great tuba. So uh, I think that's it up, up front. Uh, I want to get into the playing examples. So um, I hope that helps. Enjoy the videos and I'll see you back at the, uh, after the, the playing examples for some more input. Thanks. Bye.
Thank you. 
Okay, so I hope those playing uh, examples shed some light on the uh, qualities of this Wyvern tuba. Uh, I want to have a, a short sidebar discussion though about the playing examples on the previous videos that I've done, uh, t and &E videos number one through four, this one as well, and then uh, subsequent ones going into the future, which is I, I see some feedback from players um, commenting on the videos that saying, well, that's not necessarily an accurate representation of how the instrument might sound because Chris Olka could make anything sound good. And I'm flattered that you would say that, but let me assure you, nothing could be further from the truth. If you were a fly on the wall in my basement and you heard what comes out of my bell when I'm warming up and practicing every day, you would realize that if a tuba sounds good, it's probably due in large part to the tuba being a good instrument because I've certainly got my more than a fair share of, of uh, weaknesses of a player. And I think you, if, if, you listen, if you listen with uh, honest and open ears, you'll hear those weaknesses in these T&E videos. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the first thing. The second one is that I think that there's a, a small subgroup of people that watch these videos that are, that are anxiously awaiting my first negative review. And I'm gonna say right now, spoiler alert, you're probably, not, I won't say never, but you're probably never going to see a negative review because one of the, one of the, uh, the thresholds that a particular instrument has to cross uh, or exceed for me to even consider doing a, a review video on it is it has to be an instrument that I would be uh, interest, or interested in owning myself and purchasing or would recommend to uh, any of my students that were asking for a recommendation. So if, it, if it's a substandard instrument and it's poorly constructed or it's, you know, it, it fits such a specialized niche that I would never find myself needing, I probably won't review it. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that um, the instruments that, that do make it to uh, the review videos have already been vetted at least to some degree. You know, uh, probably the closest thing to a, a non vetted instrument, so to speak, would be that, that Wessex six-quarter uh, prototype tuba. That was a tuba that, it, it was a prototype, yes, but it was in the final stages of being prototyped, and so it had been refined. So it was not a known quantity. Uh, Jonathan was taking a little bit of a gamble by letting me play the tuba and test it and, and do a video review of it. Uh, and to his credit, every single one of the things that I thought could have been improved, because that video was, you know, was on, on balance, it was probably a positive uh, video, but I was critical of a lot of things about the instrument, and Jonathan, to his credit, addressed every single thing, and subsequently there's a, a new round of prototype development on a six-quarter piston valve B-flat tuba that Wessex is doing, that um, has a bright future, I think. I can't wait to see what that's like. So anyway, on to this tuba. I told you what I liked up front uh, in the, the opening video segment. Now I'm gonna tell you about my, uh, some things that I think, uh, they're not necessarily negative, but I think that they could be improved. Um, the first thing is slide lengths. The slide lengths, for the way that I play, which is, you know, I'm, I'm used to spending, you know, I spent most of the last 20 years playing a large six quarter tuba. I tend to blow a big, slow airstream, and I play a relatively large funnel, uh, funnel cup deep mouthpiece. And so I generally tend to put the notes low in the note. That's, that's what Warren used to call it. It's like play low in the note. So I have a low center. My, my pitch center generally is on the lower side of the spectrum. When I play this tuba uh, in 72 degrees Fahrenheit in uh, climate controlled circumstances, I can get it right to A441, which is where our orchestra tunes. And I can do that comfortably, but it's with the tuning slide almost all the way in. If, if, if it got really cold, I'm not sure that I could get, uh, uh, get the instrument up to pitch. Now again, that's, I don't know if that's this particular instrument, uh, if that's the way they all play, or if that's just a byproduct of the way that I play the tuba. I generally tend to sit low on the note, as I said, and so that may just be 
That may just be me. That may not be the tuba. So it's not necessarily a dig, but I would like a little bit more lee room on the length, specifically the main tuning slide. The other, the other slide that I find to be a little bit problematic is the length of the fifth valve tube loop. Uh, now, the fifth valve tube on this tuba is a flat Holstead. In other words, it's, it's the length of the first valve slide if you pull it out quite far. There's nothing wrong with that. The, the, by definition, the flat hole step is supposed to be a little bit low. But this one is of a length that precludes me from using some of my favorite alternate fingering combinations. I'll give you a perfect example. Low D flat and low G flat. I like, most people play those two and four, and they have their fourth valve slide out a little bit. Or they play it one, two, three, and pull the first valve slide out quite a bit. Both, both of those are options that I use. But another one that I like to use is two, three, five for low D flats and G flats. Uh, when I say D flat, D flat just below the staff and low G flat an octave below the bottom of the bass clef staff. I like that two, three, five combo for a number of reasons. It, it gives me um, some nice fingering patterns. And on this tuba with the fifth valve slide all the way in, two, three, and five uh, combinations for me are quite low. I can't quite get them up the pitch. That also bleeds into a couple of my other favorite alternate fingerings, which is E flats. Now, traditionally, we play on a C tuba, uh, E flat below staff two and three. And it's spot on pitch wise here, no problems. And it's adjustable if you want to raise it or lower it, you can with a second or third valve slides, no problem. But sometimes I like to play E flat one and five. And usually I have to push my first valve slide in almost all the way in, but with the fifth valve and the first valve, I get a a, a nice alternate fingering for, for trills sometimes or for just rapid fingering passages. Sometimes that lays a little bit better for me. Um, and on again, with the, with the fifth valve being the length that it is, I find that one five with one all the way in is still quite a bit under pitch. And then subsequently, the other one that I like is D. Now, most people play D either fourth valve, which it's, it's spot on in tune here with the fourth valve, no problems there, it's not an issue or one, three, pull one. Again, no problems playing the, uh, those notes with either of those two finger combinations, but sometimes being the weirdo that I am, I like to do one, two, five for D. Again, it, it all subscribes to that fingering technique. Now, this isn't a deal breaker and it's certainly not a knock on the tuba, but I'd, I'd like to have the option of that fifth valve combination where the fifth valve was of a length that if I push it all the way in, I can get all of my alternate fingerings in tune with no problem. But if I want it, I can pull the fifth valve slide out and get it to that lower kind of center of pitch and have uh, another set of finger, alternate fingering possibilities available to me as well. And currently it's not set up that. And, that, and that's an easy fix. I mean, there's so much straight tuning here that if you were just to, to shorten these, uh, outer tubes a couple of inches, you'd be right there. And then, like I said, if you wanted, you've got enough pull, you could lengthen it easily by pulling the slide out. But if you wanted those, those alternate fingering uh, possibilities that I've spoken of, then you push the, uh, the fifth valve loop in. So again, it's not, really a, it's not really a knock on the tuba, it's just, it's a personal preference thing. Uh, the other thing is that intonation I, I found on this, and you probably hear it in the videos, I, I'm not struggling with pitch, but some of the some of the uh, intonational tendencies are different than what I'm used to on my personal instruments. The two most notable to me are uh, E flat and E in the bass clef staff. I like to play E flat second valve on my tubas and E open in the bass clef staff. There, those notes exist on this tuba with those fingerings, but they're quite low. And that's a traditional note to be low. Many, many C tubas have that same characteristic. And I don't have any problem playing them in tune if I use the uh, kind of a standard fingering of two, three for the E flat and the staff and one and two for the E. They're in tune, they're not out of tune. I just like to use what we call short fingerings because it, you know, it, it, it gives you a little bit more security uh, when, you, when you're trying not to clamp. So again, it's not a knock on the instrument, it's just different than what I expect uh, from my own instruments. Uh, and again, on, on my personal tubas, those notes 
trend in that same direction, but they're just a little bit closer. I can easily lift my E flat second valve up and I can easily play an open E um, in tune. It's not a problem. You can do it on this, but you really have to commit to lifting quite high. Uh, I, I wrote, yeah, I'm looking at my, my notes here. I, I wrote that it's, the instrument's a bit heavy. Um, uh, on the, we the, S the Wessex website, I believe it lists this instrument at somewhere just over 25 pounds, which isn't terribly heavy. That's not a deal breaker at all. It, and I think a lot of it has to do with how robustly the instrument's constructed, the bracing, and it's, you know, it's a hydroformed instrument. It's not made out of hand-hammered sheet brass and bows. Um, so I think that, from a longevity standpoint, that's a good thing. But it, it, it is a little bit heavy, and, and it's, it puts it about two pounds heavier than the, the significantly larger uh, Chicago models that, that Wessex is making. Uh, one of the reasons that those instruments are so light is they're all hand-hammered sheet brass and thinner, thinner gauge. Um, so that accounts for some of it. But, you know, I don't know if I'd, if I'd recommend making this instrument out of uh, hand-hammered sheet brass or not. Maybe the bell, maybe the bottom bow, but it's a little bit heavy. But it's certainly far from being a tank. And like I said, it does hold together. That's the one thing that I like about it is like when I'm horsing on this too, the, the sound doesn't break up, relatively speaking. I mean, I'm, I'm blowing the snot out of it on some of the videos, but, you know, it holds together. And I think that's probably why it projects so well too. So is that a positive? Is that a negative? You know, the jury's still out. Um, let's see here. That's pretty much it. That's, that's really the only... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Jonathan. There is one more thing. And it's the, when I hold the tuba, you can barely see it in the video, where that spit key is. And this is a super easy fix. But where this is, occasionally, sometimes, if you see, it'll press on my pant leg, and it'll open up the, fit, the, the main tuning slide spit key. And that's, that's just simply a matter of putting the, uh, the lever over here instead of underneath. Again, that's a small thing. Uh, an easy fix. I'd either, you know, move the lever or I'd put a different style water key on it or something. So, uh, I think that's it. I hope the videos helped. Uh, I'm probably going to take a break from uh, reviewing Wessex Tubas for, for the near future, only because I've done the last three videos I've done now, including this one, have been Wessex Tubas. And there's a number of other models that I want to uh, review and look at. People have been requesting various F tubas as well as other manufacturers' tubas. So again, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a break on the Wessex tubas, but I will say uh, again I, to just give uh, give credit where credit's due. Uh, Jonathan and now Chuck Nichols and and now I, I understand that Wessex has hired a couple of other people to help out with the task of getting tubas around the world, as it were. Uh, they've done fantastic work. They continue to to champion. Uh, expanding the product line for what the consumer or tuba player wants. And, and believe me, there's quite a bit larger market for tuba players that aren't sitting in an orchestra like me full-time. And there's, relatively speaking, very few of us. But there's a whole lot of people that are, you know, professionals, uh, freelancers, hobbyists, amateurs, students of all levels. And I think that's where uh, the market is really being done a huge service by Wessex. Uh, so again, thanks to uh, Jonathan Hodgetts and the folks at Wessex Tubas for putting this horn in my hands to review. I hope the video is uh, helpful for you guys when you're in the, the process of deciding on what your next tuba is to buy. And uh, look forward to more of these videos coming up in the future. Thanks. Take care.